Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Karen, for allowing me this opportunity and the San Diego Horticultural Society for allowing me to come to you via Zoom. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Pam Coity Hyatt from Bird Rock Tropicals. We, I started my nursery in 1981, so we've been operating for 40 years now. I started in the Bird Rock area of La Jolla, and uh, in 1985, I moved to Carlsbad and I operated in Carlsbad for about 25 years. I focus on bromeliads, especially Tillandsias. And uh, <clears throat> we have a display garden, greenhouses, shade houses, and lots of things to see. Uh, we're online at birdrocktropicals.com and you're able to uh, book an appointment. Due to the pandemic, we uh, ask that everyone have an appointment before they come to the nursery. So I'm interested in cork because cork has always been a really great substrate for growing Tillandsias. You can put one plant on and it will flower and mature and make offsets and it can survive for several generations. And it's a really good substance for that purpose. On the right here are some of the images from uh, some of my customers in Australia. They have a little more difficulty getting product in, so they tend to grow a lot from seed, and Tillandsias take a long time to grow from seed. And they, um, they like to plant them directly on the cork, and they'll use cork stoppers to initiate some of their young seedlings. So tonight we're going to talk about cork oak. It's a natural renewable resource. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Portugal uh, four years ago and for a conference my husband had in Lisbon. And then we went on to El Antejo and visited a cork oak forest and then into the north of Portugal to see the actual cork stopper production. It's really interesting to learn all about the characteristics of cork. So first we're gonna talk about oak, the different types of oaks. Then I'll talk about um, the characteristics of cork and why it's so special. And then we'll visit the cork oak factory and see the uh, production of cork oaks. So oak trees are in the family Fagaceae and it's in the genus Quercus. Um, oak trees are really variable. The leaves are extremely diverse in size and shape and makes it really difficult to identify them. There's also great variability in the fruit the acorns and uh, <clears throat> with their size and shape. And that also adds to the difficulty, as well as there's a large number of natural hybrids that occur, especially in Mexico. So that can also complicate identifying oak species. Um, oak trees are in the genus Quercus. There's approximately 600 species in the genus and they are all native to the Northern hemisphere above the equator. The North America has the largest with 220 species. They're found growing in cool to temperate zones in a variety of habitats from sea level to 4,000 meters in the Himalaya mountains. Um, the, the species in North America, approximately 220, they consist of both trees and shrubs, and, which are mostly deciduous. And in the Western Hemisphere, the genus Quercus has been divided into three major group groups. There's the white oaks, there's the red or black oaks, and then there's the intermediate or golden oaks. So traditional Quercus classification is based on morphology. And previously it was shown that there were two subgenera and four sub and four sections. So subgenus Quercus and subgenus Cyclobalaenopsis. The subgenus Quercus includes the red and the black or black oaks, the intermediate or golden oaks, as well as the white oaks, which the cork oak Quercus suber is one of the white oaks. Um, <clears throat> the subgenus Cy Cyclobalaenopsis includes 150 species in Eastern and Southeastern Asia. The white oaks is the largest group with approximately 200 species, uh, all with leaves which are deeply lobed. And they're used, uh, the white oak is also used to make the oak barrels for wine storage. 
The English oak, which was used for shipbuilding, is also a white oak, as well as the cork oak. So in 2017, there was an updated classification that was done. And this uh, changed, th this new proposed classification changes the position of the Quercus super or the cork oak. And it has jumped or moved from the Quercus soup, uh, from, Quirk, from the subgenus Quercus to the subgenus Cirrus. And it's in the section Cirrus. Approximately 15 species jump to different subgenera or, or different sections. So this new updated classification shows two subgenera and eight sections. There's the subgenus Quercus, which is primarily New World species. And then there's the subgenus Cyclobalaenopsis, uh, which includes the Cyclobalaenopsis, which is now a section. And, um, the, and it's exclusively Eurasian or Old World clade. So the location and number of oaks in, in America, uh, I think there's about, there's more than 220. There's a few species that rise up into Canada and uh, predominantly there's a, a large number in Mexico. Uh, they'll grow in all the mountain ranges of Mexico and even in the Chihuahuan Desert Range. And there's 56 oak species in Central America and one species that's all the way down in South America here in Colombia. So the distribution of the New World species, here you can see the US and Canada, there's red oaks white, uh, and white oaks. The US has 96, Canada has 35. Mexico has the largest concentration, 180 oaks. And again, Central America, 37, South America, one. And then the old world species are, are less, um, a total distribution of 89 species, 73 in Europe, Europe and uh, 16 in, in um, North Africa. And that would include the subgenus Cirrus, which would include the cork oak. So that would be in this group here right in here. Okay, so oaks are really impressive trees. They can live to be a thousand years old and it's an extremely dense and valuable wood. But uh, these large oaks need to be 150 years old before you can harvest their wood for construction. This is an English oak and it's really prized hardwood for hardwood timber. It was the primary shipbuilding timber in the mid 19th century. And it's also used for wine barrels. Let's look at California's oaks. California has 21 species. 10 of these species are um, tree species, 11 are sh shrubs, and most of them are endemic to California. The Smithers oak was the largest volume of any oak tree in the world, um, California live oak, and it was in Mariposa County but apparently a few years ago, it fell apart and died. The image was shared to, to me from Dr. Matt Ritter, who's a professor and is an author and professor of botany at Cal Poly State University in San Luis Obispo. And he's written several books on trees and he has a new book out on a children's book on nature. Um, and I think that's Matt standing in the tree. So you can see how really large that tree was. So when that tree fell, that made this the, um, is now currently registered as the largest oak. Uh, this is in the San Bernardino Mountains. This is the Wildlands Conservancy Oak. It's also a California live oak. And in the southeastern part of the United States, we have the Quercus virginiana. It's also an evergreen. It's endemic only to the Southeast region. In the late 1700s, it was discovered that nearly half of all of the native Southeastern 
oak trees in the US were gone. Uh, most of them had been sold to foreign nations for shipbuilding. So uh, this caused some alarm and Congress enacted the Naval Timber Purchase Act of 1799 and two two um, other acts in 1817 and 1827, and these were all aimed at protecting the live oak. And here you can see it's covered with Spanish moss, which is a Tillandsia, a Tillandsia usinioides. The southern live oaks are, are really iconic trees of the south, and they can reach as much as 150 feet in diameter. So the growth habit of the oak trees, they're either trees or shrubs. The trees can be 60 to 100 feet tall. Shrubs are short, much shorter at 10 to 15 feet tall. Foliage is either evergreen or deciduous. The coastal live oak is an evergreen and the valley oak is a deciduous tree. And they have two different distinctive types of bark, either scaly and plated or smooth and hard. The fruit of the oaks are nuts with a cupel of fused bracts at the base. It's called an acorn cup. Um, the acorn cup scales of the white oaks, they're thick and knobby and warty, and the uh, red oaks have a real thin papery leaf-like cup scales. The white oaks will mature within one year. Um, the inside of the shell is hairless and uh, it's a sweet and nutty flavor. The red or black oaks mature in two years. The inside is woolly and they're usually bitter. Acorns are very important food for birds and small animals, pigs, bear and deer. However, they are toxic to horses because of the tannins, the high concentration and types of tannins that are in the acorns. So they're very toxic to horses. Acorns are sometimes ground into flour and they're also sometimes added to coffee. The cork oak, Quercus super acorn, is also an edible acorn and it can be boiled and um, just like you would a chestnut, but they tend to be sweeter and meatier than chestnuts are. And this is a common fruit in, in Northern Africa. You can find these, this, uh, the Quercus suber acorns in the markets for sale. So now we're gonna talk about cork oaks. Corks are intermediate um, oaks. They are 30 to 65 feet tall and they are evergreen trees. They will have new leaves that usually emerge in the month of April and they'll usually stay on the tree for about two years and be replaced once they fall off. Large sections of the outer bark of the cork itself are, are what's peeled, cut and peeled off the trees. And cork is really unique in its ability to regenerate its bark, making it a 100% renewable resource. The cork oak tree primarily grows in the Mediterranean region at about 500 to 1,000 foot elevation. There's plenty of sunshine in this area, low rainfall about 20 to 28 inches per year, but high humidity. But the region, um, in this region where they grow um, at 500 to 1,000 foot sea level, the mean temperature is 55 to 63 degrees. They can tolerate much higher temperatures, even up to 104 degrees and as low as 14 degrees Fahrenheit without any major damage. The cork is found um, growing in the southwestern portion of Europe, northwestern Africa, Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. Portugal is home to the largest collection of cork trees, covering an area of 750,000 hectares. Um, Portugal is the world leader in cork production, about 100,000 tons uh, which accounts for 50% of the total production in the world. And 100,000 tons is significant considering that cork doesn't really weigh anything, it's mostly air. So it takes a lot of corks to, to add up to that large amount of weight. And Portugal has been harvesting cork for more than 300 years. You can see that the next uh, 
uh, country that's close would be Spain, producing 30% of the world's cork production, but then everything significantly drops off. So the majority of the cork or oak forests are, are grown in the southeastern region of Portugal called El Entejo, which means beyond the Tejo or the Tagus River. So if you're here's Lisbon, the Tagus River, it goes up this way. So beyond the river, down into this area is where you find the majority of the cork uh, forests. And that's where I went to stay with some friends. And, and this is where we had our visit to the forests and then into the uh, plantations and up to the production areas. So the cork oak tree, once it's planted, it has very deep roots that grow downward, but the majority of its root structure is actually at the surface. The surface roots have a symbiotic relationship with the mycorrhiza, which is really beneficial not only for the tree, but for the cork and, and the fungi as well. Corks which live, can live up to 200 years are harvested about 16 times over their life. Again, they're 35 to 65 feet tall and they have a 20 to 35 inch diameter trunk. Um, so once the tree is planted during the first 25 years, not much is done to the tree. They might do some harvesting of some of the lower thin branches in order to keep the energy growing on the girth of the main trunk and allow the tree to grow up bigger. The first harvest is done when the tree is 25 years old. And that first harvest is what's called uh, virgin cork oak. And that virgin bark is what we use for mounting our plants, our tillandsias, our orchids on. And uh, it's really useless for any type of cork production. So then the next harvest, you have to wait nine years in between harvesting the tree. The next harvest, the tree is 34 years old. That second harvest will, produ reprodu will produce a better quality of cork, but it's not the finest quality. It's called reproduction cork. It's usually not good enough to make um, uh, stoppers, but it can be ground up to make granulated stoppers or cork tiles or other cork products. And then you wait another nine years, now the tree is 43 years old, and now you're able to get the finest quality cork. And this is what's harvested to make the um, cork stoppers. The saying goes that when you plant a young tree, you're planting it for your children or your grandchildren. As you can see, if it takes 43 years, it's going to be your children and grandchildren that are going to benefit from that harvest. Um, <clears throat> but nothing goes to waste with the cork trees. Uh, the, um, the acorns are used, as I said earlier, for, for planting trees and, and harvesting. Um, I'm sorry, the acorns are used to plant and repropagate trees. They're also used as a food source for animals that are in the um, forest areas. And they're also used in the production of cooking oil. The leaves are used as a natural fertilizer and as fodder. And firewood and charcoal are materials that are generated from the pruning during the early first 25 years. Natural acids found in the wood of the cork are used in <coughs> beauty products <clears throat> and chemical products. And of course, of course the bark is harvested <clears throat> every nine years and stripped from the trunk. <clears throat> and that regenerates and, and uh, produces new layers of cork. <clears throat> the cork of orc folk. Cork oak forests are home to several rare species, the Iberian lynx and the endangered Iberian uh, imperial eagle are two of them. There's also several types of fungi that coexist with the cork. Quercus suber has a very thick layer of cork bark. It, um, every tree has a layer of cork bark, but the Quercus subers is much thicker than other trees. And it's the only tree that has the ability to regenerate that cork bark after it's been harvested. The cork tree evolved to protect itself from the harsh conditions of these forests near the Mediterranean, which experience frequent droughts, brush fires, uh, temperature fluctuations. Cork oak is considered a pyrophyte 
as it easily recovers from fires, even sprouting new branches after, after fires. The cork bark structure, this is the part that has been removed. So this is looking at it at the side. This would be the inside of the tree. This is the outside. This is the section that's removed, which would be that part there that's been removed on the upper part of the trunk. When you take it off and you look at the side, this is where you would get the stoppers from and that's how they're punched out. But this um, stopper is, again, it's gonna be a tree that's 43 plus years because then now you can see you've got a fine, nice layer of cork that's got a nice consistency, which makes it very well for, for making stoppers and, and fine production. The cellular scan shows the honeycomb-like structure of the cork cells. So the corks uh, are, have a honeycomb-like structure and it's much lighter. Uh, they're real lightweight, they're water resistant, they're almost 100, they're like 80% air. Uh, natural cork provides unique uh, physical properties suited for the preservation and development of fine wine. They're resistant to rot, fire, termite resistance, impermeable to gas and liquid. It's compressible, soft and buoyant. They can withstand environmental changes in heat, cold and moisture. And none of these properties can be duplicated by anything that man, that's man-made. Uh, natural, um, cork, the cork benefits the wine by protecting against leakage, obviously and early oxidation, and it allows the wine to gain complexity and bouquet through its storage life. It's these properties that make it ideal for stopping wine, um, wine bottles. So the history of cork uh, started thousands of years ago, it was used for storage of valuable foods and beverages. The ancient e Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans, they reference cork as a preferred material for stoppers used with wine and olive oil. In the 1600s, the method for producing champagne was, was um, developed and it adopted, they successfully adopted a special technique of taking two corks and putting them together, one of composite cork and one of a pure cork, fine cork. And uh, champagne bottles have a lot of CO2 in them. So the natural cork can absorb the CO2 and expand. And the more than the granular part that, uh, at the top. And so therefore you get that mushroom shape from the uh, champagne corks. And then over the next two centuries, the spread and mass production of glass bottles standardized the size and dimensions of, of uh, of corks so that they could be mass produced for wine and also for a variety of other liquids, olive oil, vinegars, balsamics, um, multiple different foodstuffs. So because of the excellent thermal um, insulation ability of cork, they've also been used by rockets and spacecraft. Rockets and spacecraft are subjected to temperatures that exceed a, a thousand degrees centigrade during launch and re-entry into the atmosphere. So a very fine coating of cork compound, usually between a half inch and one inch, is um, placed uh, on the outside of the uh, rocket or spaceship. It depends on, on which area needs that, that protection from that heat, but they'll put that fine coating of cork and um, then they'll coat that with a, a special type of paint and that will protect the critical components for the spacecraft's safety when it re-enters. It's usually the nose cone and other parts of the propulsion uh, rockets coupled to the spacecraft that are covered. Apollo 8, the first manned spacecraft to orbit the moon in 1968. Here you can see the nose here is, is um, it's made a, a two-part layer of a aluminum, a honeycomb aluminum coating, and then that was covered with a thin layer of cork and thermal protective painting. The Apollo 8 is the first manned space aircraft that orbited to the moon 
it, it is also the first one that took the images of Earth from the moon, but it, it's uh, sort of laid the way for the landing on the moon, which happened seven months later. So cork has also been used in architecture for hundreds of years. Um, this chalet was built in 1864 for King Ferdinand's second wife, Elise. And you can see there's lots of cork details on the chalet. She was a Swiss born American naturalized opera singer and she wanted a Swiss chalet style house. And of course it had cork accents. The chalet is in Sintra, which is located in the Portuguese Riviera, which is where the Pene Palace Peña Palace, where uh, King Ferdinand II's summer retreat was built. Sintra is an important historical area and it's gained a UNESCO World Heritage designation in 1995. Cork trees on the outside. Um, on the inside, the restored dining room shows some of the interior uses of cork with inlaid cork tiles. So the chalet was surrounded by a garden with mature trees, lakes, flowering bushes, and it now forms part of the park surrounding the Pen Penna Palace. There's more than 200 botanical species, including camellias, rhododendrons, azaleas, and a large collection of Australian and New Zealand tree ferns. Trees were introduced from North America with the assistance of John Slade, an American forester who happened to be Elise's brother-in-law. Modern day architecture. Uh, this house has a cork facade is in Berlin. The cork siding was chosen for its insulating properties as well, uh, for both temperature and sound. It's also moisture and mold resistant. It's fire retardant, biodegradable, recyclable. Cork has a zero carbon footprint. Both exterior and interior applications for cork. You can see on the interior walls and on flooring, they also have different types of cork panels. So the granules of cork are, are, are formed into cork boards through a heat and pressure process. Um, the pressure uh, releases the cork's natural resin and it forms a glue that holds the cork together without any additives. The facade version on the outsides of the house are manufactured under, under slightly higher pressure and achieves a smoother and denser surface. So I'm always curious about cork trees when I see them because I just think they're a, a, a beautiful tree. There's a single cork oak tree that's planted at the Palma Valley Country Club, which, for, um, which is mostly canyon live oaks. And I've been curious about how this appeared in a valley with numerous oak trees. Well, last month there was a new plaque that was placed to honor the golf course architect, which is who is Robert Trent Jones Sr. While developing the famous Valderrama Golf Club in Spain, he learned to love the unique beauty of cork trees growing throughout the course. Apparently Valderrama has more than 2000 oak trees. And legend has it that Jones planted a cork seed at every one of his clubs as a signature to stand the passing of time. That would explain why there's only one there. The cork oak forest woodlands are known as montados in Portugal, and they're usually small family farms. Trees can live to more than 200 years. Portugal accounts for 50% of the work world cork harvest, and in 2011, um, Portugal, the cork oak tree was made the national tree of Portugal, making it illegal to cut them down. Cork oaks are found growing with other tree species, including stone and maritime pines and wild olive trees. Beneath the oaks, farmers graze sheep, goats, uh, semi-wild pigs, and allow them to fatten up on the acorns, making them a haven for wildlife. It's approximately 42 bird species that depend on the, the woodlands, including the endangered Spanish imperial eagle. And then these areas are home to great diversity of plant species. In the spring and summer, butterflies and plants thrive. More than 60 species of plants have been recorded in just one square meter. The plant and animal diversity is higher here than in many other forest regions in the world.
This forest has been harvested from the ground to the crown, and it depends on the diameter of the main of the branches, how far up they will go up the branches when they do their harvesting. When the trees are harvested, the trunk is a very pale color and it will redden in one to two days. And the inner bark will seal itself and take on an opaque stuccoed look. As the years pass, the bark will thicken and darken once again to reddish mahogany, to chestnut, and then back again to a silvery charcoal color. So this would be first harvest virgin cork oak. And you can see how rough the outer outside of the bark is. And it's very granular um, and it's uh, not useful for anything except for mounting orchids on. Oops, I think I skipped one, there we go. So this would be third harvest, 43 years plus. This is fine stopper quality cork. You can see how, how, how nice and tight it is. It's just the perfect kind of cork for making your, the stoppers. Here, these trees have been harvested and, and the numbers on the trees represent the year that the tree was harvested. So in this case, the number five would represent that the tree was harvested in 2005. So the next harvest on this tree will be nine years later, would be 2024. On the top part, the number nine, that would represent 2009, as I was there in 2017. And that means that this section will be ready to be harvested in 2018. And you can see that the bark becomes a silvery um, charcoal gray color as, as, more, as more of the cork is regenerated. And the outer edge is, is much sm uh, smoother and it's not as plated as the, the rough un unharvested portions of the tree. Uh, this is a number one. So this tree was harvested um, in 2011 and it means that the next harvest would be in 2020. And they've gone uh, up from the main trunk, they've gone up to the several branches as these branches are much thicker, so it gives them a, a good amount of um, cork to harvest. The most famous cork oak, the Whistler, is growing in the Alentejo region of Portugal. The Whistler tree is about 236 years old and, it's been, and it was named for the numerous songbirds that occupy its dense canopy. This tree is 53 feet tall and the, and the, the diameter at breast height is 14 feet. In 1988, it was classified as a tree of public interest. In 2000, it was almost taken down during an illegal urban expansion. So in 2001, laws were reformed to better protect the oaks. In 2018, this was voted European Tree of the Year, and it's registered in the Guinness Book of World Records as the largest cork oak tree in the world. So the first harvest was in 1820. It's been harvested more than 20 times. The 2009 harvest yield eight, yielded 825 kilograms of raw cork, enough for 100,000 wine bottles. In comparison, the average tree uh, will produce material for 4,000 bottles. So the Whistler tree is in excellent condition and it's well on its way to produce a total lifetime production of over a million corks to kind of get a sense of the size. Um, I think this is a recent, uh, judging by the color, I think this was during a harvest and it looks down here at the bottom like this is bark that's been piled up and it looks like there's a, a worker uh, kneeling right here. So that's an individual next to the tree. So the tree is really a very, very large tree. So the cork oak uh, harvest. Um, they In Portugal, one million trees a year are harvested. The harvest is usually done between late spring and early summer, and that's a certain time of year when the bark is more easily detached. The outer bark is, is comes off a lot easier. It begins to separate and it will come off from the tree. It doesn't hold on as tight. Uh, once the tree is harvested, the trees will absorb large amounts of CO2 during the regeneration period. It absorbs more CO2 from the atmosphere than trees that have not been harvested. 
The phelum is the outer bark, and that's the part that's removed. It's 100% natural, recyclable, re reusable, and renewable. And the work is done by skilled agricultural workers, and they use hand axes and tools. There's no machine equipment that can be brought into the woodlands um, to do this type of harvesting. They use a technique that's been passed down from the ancient Greeks. And so all of the workers pass that down to each other, and that's how it's done. These agricultural workers are the highest paid agricultural workers in Europe. Um, and they earn about, at least as of 2017, they were earning 80 to 120 euros per day. They're paid a daily wage instead of a production wage. And that's to encourage them to be careful and, and do a, a good job and, and a serious job. Because if they're not careful, they could actually go too deep and damage the, the um, inner layers of the uh, bark. And that would make the tree have some problems. They're all given workers benefits for uh, medical health care, insurance, workers compensation, and um, any type of medical care that they might need if any one of them get injured. And again, the fixed daily wage, wage is really sensibly a sensible way to pay the workers so that they're not paid to rush around through the harvest. Instead, they're paid based on a fixed daily wage so that they can be assured to do and perform their harvesting work with due diligence and regard for the health of the tree. Note how smooth the bark is in the thick uh, cork cambium. So in 2017, San Diego Botanic Garden had a demonstration of cork harvest, and it was done by Dr. Matt Ritter. Normally, because in a normal situation of a, of, a, of a harvest that would be for a much older tree in the second, third harvest, you just really want to give way. So these trees are about 65 years old and they've never been harvested. So it's a very difficult process and to, to take that first layer of bark off. See coming off there, that's a nice clean, Break with the cork cambium coming off, and this is only cork material and cork cambium. There, it's moist. I can feel it. Uh, but the crumbliness of this is what make, one of the things that makes the first harvest a real low quality harvest. Okay. So cork harvesting in Portugal. This is from the M. A. Silva company has this video and this is this is this shows you how it's done when it's when the trees are much older and the cork comes off a lot easier and it's a finer quality here you can see the axes it's all done by hand and they do usually do a, 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 a horizontal cut around the, the around the trunk of the tree and then there's a vertical cut down the side and then they can just peel it right off so we'll watch this just for a little bit so you can see how these big slabs come off the tree and they have to know just how far and how deep to cut. Here we go, here it comes. So it's ready to come off and it comes off as one big, big piece. And then you should take it all the way down to the ground. So after the cork is harvested, it's allowed to settle and rest for about six months. Usually it's done outside and it just lays on the ground or on a cement slab or wood slab and it's it just settles. Um, here you can see this cork on the right is not quite the best quality. It will probably be ground up and used for um, composite corks. So then we went to the M.A. Silva Cork Production Factory. We are cork. You saw the men working on the uh, uh, with the axes. They were wearing t-shirts that say we are cork. They're from the M.A. Silva factory. This uh, production factory is located near Porto in northern Portugal. Um, in fact, port is one of the first uses for cork stoppers. There was this interesting art wall art 
at their offices and it shows the entire production of the cork process. So it shows the slabs, the, all the workers cutting and punching, packing, and it's kind of an interesting little piece of art, all made out of cork with a rough virgin cork frame. So again, the, the planks were cut, they're resting, they rest for six months, then they're brought to the uh, production factory for making uh, stoppers, and the planks are then boiled for an hour. Um, and this boiling process is used to uh, flatten and expand the, um, the bark and make it a little more pliable. The boiling allows the individual cork cells to fill up with um, completely and expand that honeycomb cell structure that we saw. And then they can lay them out flatter as they are here, and then they let them rest for about three weeks. And it makes the cork plank flatter, smoother, and more pliable. And it causes the plank's volume to actually expand by about 20%. So that's the, after the three week resting period, then they're brought into the factory where the planks are then cut into strips as tall as the finished cork. And then the cork stoppers are all punched by hand. So this gentleman is holding a strip that was cut from the, the larger planks. And here you can see the stoppers. The, um, the punch knife is the exact diameter of the cork that the uh, customer has ordered for his bottles. And I'm just gonna push this one more time so you can see it again. Uh, this is all done by the manual labor. They, he uses his leg to, to move the knife blade in. And he punches his, and to get as many corks out of each piece that he can. Anything that's left over, like the piece on the right, that will be then ground up and used for um, um, granular uh, uh, composite corks. And then if, if, a, if a cork stopper is, if it's, if it's punched too short, then those will be um, sliced up and used for discs. After they're punched, then they go through a sanding and optical sorting machines. And uh, then they're separated into different baskets based on their weight or size. And this is the same way they've been doing it for many, many years. Any unused cork, scraps, dust, those are all collected and processed into the other cork products, such as insulation and construction materials. None of this product is wasted. Each and every cork is uh, digitally scanned on all sides and top, bottom, and sides. They want to make sure that it's the perfect measurement that was re um, requested by the customer's order. They're also tested for strength and compressibility. And if it doesn't meet the specs, it will be ground up for um, granular corks or sliced into little discs. The corks are washed and disinfected. Um, the ones that have met all the criteria are then washed and disinfected and they use a variety of methods. The most common method is a solution of hydrogen peroxide. Um, uh, newer methods are microwave or ozone. And then the final sorting process, uh, I found that really fascinating. That is really done by women who've been working at the company for more than 30 years. And they're able to visually sort for different types of wine considering um, uh, uh, what they're given in the morning, they're given a selection of six types of wine stoppers that they're, cert that are, they're looking for. And as the stoppers come down the the belt here, you can see they pull them out and just throw them into the bucket that match the type of stopper that, that's being ordered. And with their experience, they're able to do this visually. So the final step would be printing um, with ink or branding. 
there's also random testing for TCA in the laboratory. TCA is trichloral an an anisole. It's a natural compound that imparts flavors called corked. And that's what makes, uh, if you open a bottle of wine that's um, corked, uh, it's from this natural compound. They're randomly tested. Some uh, customers can have their um, sample um, on request, they can have each and every one of their corks that they've ordered tested for TCA. So very expensive, but that can be done. Um, samples of each customer's order are kept for six months in case there's any problem that comes up once the customer has begun to use the product in their wine production. So these are all packed and ready to go. MA Silva ships worldwide. They have facilities in Santa Rosa, Australia, several in Europe and South America. These bags hold 10,000 um, corks per bag and, and they ship 40 million corks each day or they produce 40 million corks a day. Here's some samples and comparisons of the different styles of corks. They can either be natural or bleached um, branded, they're used with, um, they're used with plastic or um, composite ends. Here you can see a composite cork, you can see the granules from being all ground up and compressed together. And sometimes they'll use a two-part a composite cork and then at the very end they'll put a disc here, right here we can see a disc of natural cork. And that's useful for wines that require medium aging as only a small amount of air can reach the wine. My favorite cork that I've found is one that actually tells the entire story of Quercus Super. It says Quercus Super here. The harvest date here of this cork was June of 2014. It tells you that the cork forests are, provide a, a valuable habitat to endangered animals. Um, it's a renewable, sustainable um, product. So um, we were in Alentejo. We drove north through Coimbra up towards Porto, which up in this, in, in this area here is where the cork factory, production factory was. But driving through Coimbra, I noticed lots and lots of eucalyptus trees and eucalyptus are not native to, to Portugal. And I became curious about that. So of course I checked the old Google and, and learned that in 1866, 35,000 eucalyptus trees were introduced by Sir Joseph Banks to um, control devastating erosion as a result of the loss of woodlands near Coimbra. Also thinking that it would, um, they were also thinking that it would drain the swamplands and reduce malaria. And that was fine. Those 35,000 trees sat until 1970, when in 1970, Scandinavia, um, the St Scandinavian com companies started buying small farms and planted crops of eucalyptus for paper pulp. The problems here, uh, this created a lot of problems. There's a lot of land and, and that was in farms that were destroyed and re replaced with eucalyptus trees. The eucalyptus trees created a lot of problems by decreasing the water table. There's also no native birds, insects, or animals that will live in the eucalyptus forest. So they're completely quiet and silent. There's, it's not a, the same type of habitat that the oak woodlands are. And another result of the eucalyptus, eucal the, the largest number of eucalyptus in Europe are in Portugal. It's about 800,000 acres. And they do create an additional fire danger. From January um, in 2006 to 2016, 10 years, 21,000 hectares burned. But the first six months of 2017, 118,000 hectares burned. And then in 2017, it finished with 500,000 hectares and in 2020, 520,000 hectares. So this has really caused big problems. And many of the, uh, many things have happened in Portugal to try and, and change this. There's, 
cork oak tree was made the national tree in 2011, and they've increased fines. If you cut down cork oaks, they would, many people would like them to have more corks growing instead of the eucalyptus. The other problem is that they're planted so dense and close together that they that they become it becomes difficult to evacuate these areas once they start um, burning. So in 2005, the Cork Forest Alliance Cons Conservation Alliance was started, and they um, are instrumental in recycling your corks, and you can recycle your corks to them. They frequently will have bins at Whole Foods or Lazy Acres. Currently, due to the pandemic, they're on pause. So you'll have to wait till after when, when that can happen. And these are the trees that were harvested at the demonstration at the uh, quail of the uh, San Diego Botanic Gardens. And you can see that the, they're, they're fine and healthy. Um, and the Botanic Gardens has also put a plaque up in front of these trees to explain why the the, the um, bark is, is scarred so that people understand that cork is a renewable resource. And with that, I'd like to thank you for allowing me this opportunity. And um, if you have any questions, I can answer those or thank you.